Good evening. Welcome, everyone. Uh, those of you who are here earlier, we've enjoyed a couple of good sessions already and anticipate some good meetings yet tonight. We'll get started tonight by standing and singing together in times like these, number 382. 382. Let's sing together now. In times like these, you need a Savior. In times like these, you need an anchor. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips the solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. a solid rock. In times like these, you need the Bible. In times like these, oh, be not idle. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. This rock is Jesus. Yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips a solid rock. In times like these, I have a Savior. In times like these, I have an anchor. Be very sure. Very sure, my anchor holds and grips a solid rock. This rock is Jesus, yes, he's the one. This rock is Jesus, the only one. Be very sure, be very sure. Your anchor holds and grips a solid rock singing. Thank you. You may be seated. Thank you, Larry. Appreciate it. He's a, a joy to work with, Larry is. Appreciate you, buddy, so much. We have had a good time already today. We really have. We had good turnout for the early sessions and got some different folks here tonight as well. Not that you're different. You're, you're normal, but we got some some different ones, but well, they're all going somewhere else. Um, we're talking tonight uh, about some special things from Jim Berg. He's unmasking addiction. I thought I was unleashing addiction, but I didn't have my glasses on. So that was a problem. But we're talking about that. He is, he's been such a blessing to us already today. He is uh, a man I've enjoyed getting to know these last few days. We've met before, but just briefly. And I didn't have the opportunity to see his real personality. <laughs> it's, uh, he's a joy to be around. That's what I'll tell you. He really is. And I'm just so thankful. And same for Kevin. Kevin's a little more strange, but it's still, he's an enjoyable guy. And we, we love having him here. He was telling me some stories at supper tonight. I won't go into it because it's, it would be embarrassing for you, but. We had a good time with it for sure. We want you to know about the things that are going on. Those who are wondering where the restrooms are, uh, all the way down the hallway, all the way down the hallway there. Either way, this is the closest one over here. If you're looking for that, that's where you will look and succeed. I'm on some medication and I don't know if you can tell. <laughs> I really am. I, I've had a cold all day long today and I've taken all kinds of different medications for this and uh, I'm not certain if we found the one that really works or not but are any of the rest of you seeing flashes of light before your eyes right now <laughs> thank you it would be very 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 helpful it really would but uh, we just have had such a good time and to learn about the 
principles for helping people who are addicted. This is a, a problem that is hitting churches as well as just our general population. So we are so thankful that we have someone that can share this with us and lay out a program that uh, some of our people are very interested in getting started here. So we're looking forward to seeing how that all works out. Let's bow before the Lord, and then we'll turn this over to Jim here in just a second. Lord, I thank you so much for your kindness to us. Thank you that we can join together tonight to hear once again how we can help people who are going through these, these terrible battles of addiction. And Lord, may we have compassion on them and love for them because they need you so badly. And we just thank you, Father, that we can present the Lord Jesus and see some genuine results. Thank you, Father, for all your goodness. Bless us now, I pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Larry's going to come and lead us once again. Jim, I just faked you out, didn't I? I knew I did. He's going to lead us, and then Jim will come again. All right. Earlier today, we sang Amazing Grace, and there's a, a chorus, actually, it's been written recently, kind of a theme chorus, if you will, for our conference this weekend, and so we're going to sing that together again now. You can remain seated. We'll sing the stanzas of, of Amazing Grace, and then add on a chorus after the second stanza, and then after the fourth stanza, we'll sing together, My Chains Are Gone, a great, great message and theme for our conference this weekend. So let's sing that together now. <laughs> sweet the sound that saved a wretch like me. I once was lost, but now am found. Was blind, but now I see. T'was grace that taught is relieved. How precious did the grace appear the hour I first believed. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, ransom me. And like a flood, His mercy reigns. Unending love, amazing grace. Many dangers, toils, and snares I have already come. Tis grace hath brought me safe thus far, and grace will. Secures, he will my shield and portion be as long as life endures. My chains are gone, I've been set free. My God, my Savior, ransom me. And like a flood, his mercy reigns, unending love. Amazing grace. Well, it was a wonderful uh, meal together. Hope you got uh, to do some good fellowshipping and uh, got fed up while you're uh, eating. But it's been a been a good day so far. Uh, let me ask you this, just a couple of housekeeping things. How many of you are here tonight that were not here this afternoon? I see your hands. All right, uh, numbers of you. Um, there are a couple of pieces I'm going to repeat um, be because of that uh, that I think are really important. Uh, won't take but a, a couple of minutes. So you, you have a handout in, um, uh, in your packet there called Unmasking Addiction. And I, I want to talk about uh, the goals for this session. Um, this is not so much a, a discipleship session as my next one will be, and as, as Kevin's and other speakers are, 
But um, when we're dealing with um, addiction, uh, the world has a lot of ideas about that. And a lot of that, and a lot of folks in the church are kind of breathing the secondhand smoke of the world. And I want to dislodge our confidence in uh, what um, the, the popular views are. So I want to dislodge that confidence in the current myth that addiction is a disease. I want to reinforce that science rightly interpreted never contradicts the words of God. Our God is uh, the God of creation and the God of the special revelation in the scriptures and um, any scientific study that is done honestly and interpreted honestly will never contradict the Bible uh, because God doesn't contradict himself. Um, and I want to demonstrate some of that tonight. And then I want to provide a basic understanding of the voluntary slavery, the, the nature of, of our sin. And um, I'm indebted to um, Ed Welch in his book, Addiction Banquet in the Grave, for that phrase that, that addiction is a voluntary slavery. And uh, I think that's very descriptive. So let's, let's look at unmasking addiction scientifically. Um, a common definition is from the American Society of Addictive Medicine. Uh, they define addiction as a treatable chronic medical disease involving complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experience. Now, that's, that's a fairly common, uh, and there, there are different variations of that, but the problem with it is that it is so broad that can also describe a young couple in love because there are complex interactions among brain circuits, genetics, the environment, and an individual's life experiences. You, you can just put, put anything into that definition because anything we experience is gonna have some of those components in it. So it's not particularly helpful. But there are some perceived advantages to the disease model of addiction. Um, it seems to explain how addiction feels. If, if you have uh, a stomach virus and um, you cannot help, uh, depending on the extent of the virus, but you cannot help uh, vomiting if you have, if you have that sensation um, and, it, and because you, you have a disease, you're fighting some kind of a bug, bacterial or viral or something. Um, and it feels like you just have to do this. And addiction can have that feel to it that it just has, I just have to do this. So it may, the medical model may seem to explain how addiction feels. It also is an attempt and a very um, uh, well-documented attempt to socially destigmatize addiction. And so that's one of the reasons why that, because we, we don't, we don't uh, fault anybody for um, having cancer. We don't try to counsel them about their sin practices that develop cancer. And so it, it seems that if we can call this a disease, people are not responsible for their diseases. Uh, thirdly, it points to medical uh, treatment as a solution. And um, if you ever want to uh, look at an expose of the recovery program, there's, uh, uh, there's a documentary. I think you can get it on Netflix and iTunes uh, called The Business of Recovery. Um, fascinating expose of, of the, the addiction recovery, which is a multiple billion dollar industry and, and growing all the time because of the increase. And, and so if you can call it a medical disease, then you can collect insurance from it. Uh, if it's a bad habit uh, or, or something of that nature, of course, you can't, you can't uh, use your insurance to pay for, uh, for the treatment. Um, it permits, because calling a disease permits financial and grant benefits for scientific research. And lastly, oh, I already mentioned this, it authorizes insurance payments for treatment facilities and practitioners. And I, I don't want to address this, this lecture just as a, uh, I am a, I am a very committed biblical counselor, but I want you to hear this from uh, other voices from the secular world. So I'm going to give you some uh, descending secular views of addiction. I've listed several uh, uh, authors and practitioners and researchers there in your notes and their, their major works. I'll give you some uh, quotes here on the screen as we go along. Uh, Stanton Peel is, is a remarkable researcher. 
Um, he's, uh, he is a psychologist and uh, an attorney, addiction expert and investigator for five decades. Uh, the Atlantic uh, magazine said he's one of 10 people who are revolutionizing how we study addiction and recovery. Written 12 books in uh, many, many, many articles. Uh, his books are very fascinating. Reading his most recent one is called Outgrowing Addiction. And the, the subtitle is, um, um, oh, I, I still don't have it in the notes and I can't read it there. Um, Anyway, it's a, it's a neat subtitle. Look it up on Amazon if you want. <laughs> um, but he says, what, what determines whether or not drug use escalates into addiction? And the prognosis, once it has, has less to do with the power of the drug and more with the social, personal, economic circumstances of the user. And I discussed that a little bit in a previous session. He said, people don't become addicted to opioids as a rule because they have other purposes in their lives with which using the drug interferes. And I, I mentioned that this afternoon. Um, his, his books are really fascinating. He has one called um, uh, The Meaning of Addiction and one Addiction Proof Your Child and all the coping skills you need to, uh, to teach your child so he doesn't go into addiction. Actually, Mark Shaw's book, of uh, addiction proof parenting is much better because it's from a biblical counseling perspective. Uh, but it's interesting to watch honest researchers uh, present the problems as we would present them as a, from the scriptures, but they, have, they don't have the right answers to those problems. Uh, Arnold Ludwig is another dissenting view. He's a, um, a psychiatrist. He's adjunct professor of psychiatry and human behavior at Brown University School of Medicine. He's professor emeritus of the Department of Psychi uh, Psychiatry, University of Kentucky Medical School, former professor and chair of the Department of Psychiatry, University of Kentucky College of Medicine. I, and I cite all of the background of these men to show you these are not fly-by-night um, quacks operating out of a, you know, a, a back room in, a, in an alley somewhere. The, these are men who really are at the head of the addiction uh, research and, and practice. Uh, he says in his book, uh, Understanding the Alcoholic's Mind, the nature of the urge or compulsion to, to drink depends on the predominant way each individual thinks. It's not a disease. He says the first thing alcoholics must do is recognize just how clever, persistent, and seductive their minds can be at providing them with justif justification to drink. Now, that, that, that um, is true of all of us in, in the sinful nature of our hearts. Our, our minds are very persistent and creative in providing reasons for why we want to do what we want to do and how we're going to cover it up, how we're going to get it. Um, again, as I read the next, the next phrase, think about about our own lives. Now, none of us have any problems, but all the people out there that we know, think about them, all right? Uh, typical of the thought processes are, he's talking about alcoholics here, typical of the thought processes are tendencies to feel sorry for themselves, to blame others for whatever goes wrong, to nurse grievances, to be preoccupied with petty concerns, to dwell on the past, to keep imagining the worst, to feel alienated from others, to shirk responsibilities, to overreact to frustrations, to act impulsively, and to become obsessed with immediate pleasures. And he's, you know, he's defined the human heart, uh, the sinful human heart in, in many ways. He, and then he talks about the way that uh, the alcohol, the book is called The Alcoholic's Mind or, or Mindset, talks about their mental scripts. These mental scripts all share one feature in common. They, they reflect, reflect a basic discontent. And if you've been through uh, quite a noisy soul, you know how, how important gratitude is instead of discontent in uh, how, we, uh, how we respond to life's circumstances and how we draw upon the resources of our God. They reflect a basic discontent or unhappiness with the way things are imagined to be, have been, or will be. It is difficult enough to recover to recovering alcoholics to stay dry, but when they constantly believe that something is wrong or amiss in their lives, then they continue to remain susceptible to the instant easy solutions that alcohol has to offer. 
and, and again, just revealing some of the, the, the nuances of the human heart, the sinful human heart. Uh, another dissenting voice is um, Bruce Alexander, psychologist, researcher, and author, professor emeritus at Simon Fraser University in Canada, famous for Rat Park experiments in the 1970s. I'll talk about those. He's avowed atheist and socialist. Um, some very interesting things that happened in the 60s as the cultural revolution and the sexual revolution uh, came into focus in the 60s. I was in high school in the 60s. I was a hippie wannabe at that time. And, um, and of course, the drug, the drug culture was really growing as uh, many, many people in college campuses uh, in particular experimented with drugs. Well, scientists were alarmed by this, of course, and trying to figure out what, what are these drugs doing? They're hallucinogenics and they're, they're the opioids and, and uh, you know, drug addiction has been around since poppies were invented almost. Um, but uh, uh, there, there became some real concern in the scientific community in the, in the 60s. And so they began experimenting with a lot of rats to see what you know what the, what these various drugs would do and so they would put rats in in these cages and the, the whole wall of a lab would be just lined with cages and the, the rats couldn't see each other they were the only open part was facing the lab and and they would give these rats um a choice of water for, for uh hydration and heroin water they would they would uh, put some heroin in the water sweeten it a little bit because it's a little bit bitter and within, uh, you know, a, a few hours, the, the rats were drinking the heroin water all the time. So the, the conclusion, the false conclusion, but the conclusion was that the drug is keeping this rat coming back to the drug. So the problem is in the drug. So just say no to drugs. And, and, um, and, and that's how all of that developed because they thought the problem was in the drug. Well, he, he got thinking, he said, rats don't live in solitary confinement like they do in these laboratories. So he created what became known as Rat Park. And he created this L-shaped run in uh, one corner of one of the labs and took the same, the same rats that were in these cages and let them run loose in Rat Park. And there are tin cans and all kinds of stuff. And, and they went scurrying around and they're playing with everything and they're making babies and they're doing, they're just having a fun old time as rats. And they gave them the same choice between water and heroin water. And they chose the water every time. And he said, you would use heroin too, heroin too if you were in solitary confinement. <laughs> rats weren't made to live in solitary confinement and neither are we. That's one of the cruelest forms of punishment next to capital, uh, capital punishment that we have. And I, I'm not saying I'm against it. I'm just saying it's, it's a very difficult way to live in, in that kind of isolation. And at the same time, there were some studies being done in uh, Vietnam uh, with Vietnam vets who went over uh, to Vietnam in the 60s and early 70s. And um, when they went over uh, within just weeks, over half of the men who went over were using heroin on a regular basis and used it their entire tour of duty. And of course, the, the VA was very concerned about that and followed them uh, as they came back to civilian life. And they discovered that a high 90% of these men dropped using heroin the, the moment they got on US land and never relapsed. Well, if the problem is in the drug, that's impossible. But as I said earlier, the drug was now, the, the drug served a purpose over in Vietnam to mask all the junk that they had to deal with and all that. But when they came home, the drug interfered with what they wanted to get back to. Their, their families and their jobs and their bowling leagues or softball leagues or whatever. And now the drug no longer served a purpose for their life of solving problems. It interfered with the life that they wanted to get back to. Uh, Bruce Alexander, the Rat Park uh, fellow, said today's rising tide of addiction to drug use and a thousand other habits 
uh, is the consequence of people rich and poor alike being torn from the close ties of family, culture, and traditional spirituality. I think that's interesting since he's an atheist. Traditional spirituality that constituted the normal fabric of pre-modern times. So he said the, the fundamental problem of humanity that's driving drug addiction is their, what he calls dislocation. It's that they're yanked away from community and so forth. So there was another movement that started uh, that, uh, that says the opposite of addiction is connection. And, and certainly uh, connection is an important part of, of us ministering to men and women in the church. Uh, because they, as I said earlier, they have burned uh, most of their relational bridges and their families have kicked them out, don't want anything to do with them. They've moved from friend to friend, the couch in one friend's apartment to another one to another one. And, and uh, they're dislocated in this sense. They don't have any place to belong and they don't have anybody to belong to. And, um, and the church can provide a connection, a small community and a small group or in the church itself where they have a sense of belonging and where people are uh, willing to accept them. Now, we don't accept the lifestyle, but they're image bearers of God. We had one young man come to freedom at last some, uh, some years ago, and uh, his, uh, his name was Michael, and his girlfriend had heard about freedom at last when she was in the Phoenix Center detox uh, facility in Greenville, and she was a believer, grew up in a Christian home, but away from God. And she'd been dating Michael, who'd been on and off different things. And uh, she'd heard about freedom at last in the detox because another man in detox, uh, his wife was attending freedom at last. And, and he wanted to get to it as soon as he got out of detox. And so Amy decided, she said, that's what I need too. I need a faith-based um, uh, ministry. And so uh, she got Michael to come. She said, Michael, we're going to go to freedom at last. So I'm, I'm doing the newcomer class during the regular small group time. I meet with the newcomers, the first timers, and I give them uh, kind of an overview of freedom at last. And Michael, uh, Michael and Amy were there and, and he's, he's covered in tats. I mean, he's got ink all over his body. And, um, and it, so when, when we were done visiting, uh, when I was done teaching, I was visiting with them, and I said, Michael, Amy, I'm just really glad you're here. He looked and he said, are you sure? Her church doesn't want me around. Everybody looks at me really weird. And I said, I hope nobody here uh, has any problem with, with you coming to our church. We, you're an image bearer of God. And I didn't know he's a believer or not, but he is an image bearer of God. I said, you're an image bearer of God, and you're and, and there's a certain way God wants us to treat every image bearer. And I hope, and if you ever have any trouble with anybody in this church, I hope you'll tell me because we'll straighten that out. And he said, you know, I, you know, tonight, I, I really feel like you all want me around here. And I said, we do, Michael. And I said, what kind of work do you do, Michael? And he said, I can't get a job. He said, nobody will hire anybody with this much ink. That's got to be one of the dumbest things I ever did in my life. I can't get a job. And uh, he, he finally got one at Starbucks in a couple of weeks, but, but he, um, he was, he said, I said, well, Michael, if you had a job, what would you be doing? He said, well, I'm a musician. And I said, really, what do you play? He said, I, I play the guitar. He said, I, I, could, I could play, I know a couple of songs about God. I could play them here. And Amy elbows him and she said, Michael, they mentioned God, but they're not Christian songs. And he said, oh, okay. He said, well, maybe, maybe I shouldn't play them here. Well, I put Michael in, into the um, care group of one of our seminary students and um, who, who just really has a heart for evangelism. In fact, he and his wife are now in uh, a Muslim country uh, ministering there. And, uh, but I put him in, in Jonathan's group. And uh, Michael, after a couple of weeks in the group, he said, Jonathan, he said, we, you know, I'm, I'm, I'm learning some new friends here. He said, we got to go hang out somewhere. What do you do to hang out? And Jonathan said, well, I go to the snack shop at Bob Jones and talk to my friends about theology <laughs> over a cup of coffee. And he said, well, let's do that. Let's go to Bob Jones. And then he said, you think they'll let me come? And he said, oh, yeah, they'll let you go. So um, my wife and I at that time were, were uh, running our singles ministry. And we had about 70 men and women in our singles class who, who were out of college and career or in grad school. And so uh, Michael came 
to Sunday school and he was giving his testimony of going to the snack shop. And he said, I'll tell you what happened. He said, Michael took me to the snack shop and he said, those, those Bob Jones students, they just, they just welcomed me. They were so kind and we sat there drinking our coffee. And then, and then Jonathan opened his Bible and it's like he was inside my head. And he said, I saw that I was a sinner. And he said, you know what? I can tell you this morning, Sunday morning, all my sins are forgiven. All my sins are forgiven. And, and the class is just clapping, you know, and it's really exciting. And, and he, uh, uh, and a couple of weeks later, or several weeks later, he met with a pastor and gone through some things about baptism. And he wanted to get baptized. And um, uh, he was up there and he just devoured his Bible in those weeks. Uh, by the way, that was Sunday. Monday, uh, and, and so Sunday, he said, Jonathan, don't they, don't they have some chapel or something over at Bob Jones? I, I need more Bible. And then Jonathan said, yeah, come to chapel with me. It's 11 o'clock. And so, uh, so he went to Goodwill and he got, a, he got a sport coat, put over his blue jeans and his t-shirt. And he came, to, he came to chapel and sat up in the balcony. And in God's providence, I was preaching that morning. And he said, Jim, I almost stood up and said, hey, Jim, it's me, Michael, up here. And I said, Michael, I wish you had, because I would get to introduce the whole student body to a new brother. And he said, well, I didn't think it was appropriate. And I said, well, it would have been fine if you did. It's fine that you didn't. Well, a few weeks later, he got baptized, and he was um, giving his testimony. And he said, I just finished the Gospel of Luke today. I read Matthew, and now I'm in Luke, and I just finished it. And he said, I read about those two thieves on the cross mocking Jesus. He said, I used to mock Jesus. But if I die today, I'm going to be in paradise with him, just like that thief. Well, you know what that does to a church, hearing that kind of a testimony? And he got baptized, and, and he, he, he went out west, uh, Oregon, to take care of his mother a few months after that. But he just grew. One, one day, as, a, as he was walking out of the church uh pastor was greeting folks and and he and he's he's a tall guy he's you know six something or other really really tall and he came up to pastor and he and he took his fist and he just slammed it into his shoulder on his way out and he said hey dude he said i gotta tell you something this is the first real family i've ever had it this is faith baptist church this is my family and pastor said that's that's the best compliment our church could ever have that somebody who's never had a family thinks i found one and on freedom and freedom at last on friday nights we sing happy birthday anybody had a birthday and i say after they get done i say you know why we do that why we sing happy birthday and they all say in unison because we're family and they find their family in their local church well all of that um I'm not sure exactly how it got on that, was, but it was important to tell you. Um, the last dissenting ver uh, person that I want to uh, share with you is um, uh, Mark Lewis. He's a, 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 a developmental psychologist. That means he, he studies how children develop over the years and through different stages, how they develop cognitively and emotionally and all that kind of thing. And he's also, um, uh, he's, uh, he's a professor at uh, Radboud University in the Netherlands. He's a developmental psychologist and a neuroscientist. And he's author and contributing author, speaker, blogger on addiction related topics. He, he himself was um, a drug addict in the 60s um, and, and um, got kicked out of Yale because he wasn't coming to classes and flunking everything he was going, in, uh, he was uh, studying. And uh, went around uh, over to Europe and out to India and talked to the Maharashi and all those people out there trying to find himself and finally and and on drugs and everything and finally woke up one day and said this is not the way I want my life to be and he quit and uh, came back to the U.S. and and finished his uh, his doctoral work but his his uh, signature book is one called the biology of desire and if you're interested in neuroscience um, and uh, like this guy this is a fascinating book he's not a believer um, he has a, a, a book called The Memoirs of an Addict, and it's his life story. It's, it's rather rough and crude, but it, it uh, really shows you the struggles internally of, of a man struggling with addiction. 
Here's what he says. Uh, in, in fact, the book is called The Biology of Desire, Why Addiction is Not a Disease. He said, calling addiction a disease is not only inaccurate, it's often harmful. And, and by the way, in, in a lot of research, the single most important factor to guarantee that a person will continue to be an addict is if he believes he has a disease. That is the single most important factor keeping him in addiction. If you've got a chronic lifelong disease and you believe that, then there's no hope for you to ever get out of it. All you can kind of do is deal with your dry times and, and, and so forth. He said, brain disease may be used as a metaphor for how addiction seems, but it's not a sensible explanation for how addiction works. He says, addiction results from the motivated repetition of the same thoughts and behaviors until they become habitual. He said, medical researchers are correct that the brain changes with addiction, but the way it changes has to do with learning and development, not disease. So of course your brain changes. You couldn't learn anything if, you, if your brain didn't change. That's how we learn, our brain changes. And he said, that's called learning. He's a developmental psychologist, remember, and also a neuropsychologist, uh, a, a neuroscientist. Um, but he says, what, what happens, and the book spells this out in, in uh, detail medically, but he said, you, you have, you know, a portion of your brain uh, helps you in the repetition developing habits. And then there's another portion of your brain and, and many pieces of brain work together, but, but basically the amygdala, which is your emotional center. And uh, when, it, when there's, a, a, when there's a, a real high emotional experience, the amygdala uh, bookmarks that. And when you repeat the same behavior with the same um, um, high, uh, high from your behavior, whether it's a, a sexual high or whether it's a, a drug high or the high of the pursuit of gambling or whatever, your brain remembers that high. And, and, and when you, the more you repeat, the more it's habituated. And if it has an emotional high to it, it your body, your brain super habituates it to an obsession and also begins pruning because, because and, he, and he says, men and women, I explained all this, but he says, you got to understand something. Your brain isn't addicted. You are addicted. We don't know who the you of you is, but it's you that's addicted. The person, it's not your brain. Your brain is just reflecting all of your choices and helping you with your choices by habituating your repeated choices. And if they had high emotional elements, it really super habituates it. And, um, uh, and, he, and he, he said, this is how all compulsions develop in, uh, with the brain, but it's, it's actually just responding to the choices that you are making. So what are the disadvantages of the medical uh, disease model? Um, it's not universally accepted in the research world. Uh, it removes all hope. Um, and the successes can't be explained medically. So you go back and look at those Vietnam vets who 90 some percent of them stopped using heroin the minute they hit the US shores. How do you explain that medically if that's a disease? That doesn't happen with your cancer when you come back to the US. It doesn't happen with your diabetes when you come back to the US. Point A on your notes there under number three says the majority of addicts become sober on their own with no treatment. Popular policy, this is uh, Mark Lewis, neuroscientist, popular policy ignores compelling data collected by a variety of independent organizations, most famously the National Epidemiolog Epidemiologic logic survey on alcohol and related conditions showing that most addicts and alcohols do recover and that a majority of those up to three quarters depending on where you get your statistics recover without any treatment try that with your cancer try that with with um, other diseases um, that are, are true diseases point b under that 85 percent of addiction treatment centers and plans use AA or non-medical treatment. So if you, if you, go, to a, uh, if you go to a clinic or a, a resident facility, 85% um, 
uh, or, uh, um, of them in the U.S. are using an AA 12-step model, which is, not, which is not dealing with anything medical. It's all a talk therapy of some sort. And the evidence-based research of the effectiveness of 12-step is between 5 and 8% success rate. So think about that, men and women. We have 85% of the facilities and, and the, the clinics in the U.S. dealing with addiction are using a treatment plan that has a 5 to 8% success rate. And we're paying thousands of dollars a month for many of those facilities. He says, success rates from typical abstinence programs seems to center in the 5 to 10% range. Um, that's from Stanton Peel. Uh, Lance D Dodis, who's another more recent author, uh, says these studies support the fact that roughly 5 to 8% of the total population of people who enter AA are able to achieve and maintain sobriety for longer than a year. Uh, that is a, that's a tragic group of statistics. AA enjoys a reputation far above their evidence-based success rate. And if you go to, and, and, and this, um, the, the documentary, The Business of Recovery, uh, talks a great deal about that and where all of these clinics come up with their own 85% rate, uh, they'll, they'll do follow-up with uh, the people who have gotten out of their facility and uh, they'll call them a month later and say, are you clean and sober? Yeah, man, it's been really great. And then the researchers will follow up with those same people and ask and, and have them do a drug test and they're, and they're all dirty. And they say, why did you tell them you're doing well? And say, well, they didn't help me the first time. They're just going to want to get me back if I told them I was using again. They didn't help me the first time. Why would I, why would I think they could help me the second time? And I was paying $5,000 a month for that, that treatment. I'm not going to pay $5,000 a month again. They didn't help me. So when, when, the re, when the real research evidence base is that there's a very low success rate in all of those. Number four, and, and by the way, again, if you are looking for uh, a resident facility for somebody that you know that has uh, struggles with uh, addiction of, of any sort, go to www.theaddictionconnection.org theaddictionconnection.org. There are a lot of blogs and articles that are just fascinating for you to read, podcasts you can follow, but it also has a list of resident facilities uh, for both men and women who treat addiction with a biblical counseling model. And there's a list of uh, counselors who've been through biblical counseling training uh, that are interested in helping people. So there are resources there at that website, theaddictionconnection.org. Uh, number four, the addiction, the disease models ignore, a disease model ignores the, the real problem, fallen people facing life on a fallen planet without a growing word-based relationship with Jesus Christ. So what are some scientific takeaways we can gain from this? One, uh, number one in your notes, people desire and choose mood-altering experiences and substances when faced with the challenges of life for which they do not have adequate personal resources or solutions. Addictive substances and experience become a temptation when a person is facing the trials of life without personal relationship with and grace and wisdom from God. Number two, the choices of the human heart are reinforced by the body. It's another takeaway. Chemically and neurologically, changes are expressed overtly primarily through the central nervous system and covertly primarily through the autonomic nervous system and the neurobiology of the brain. God made the body to be a servant of the heart. Once wrongly trained or habituated by a misguided heart, the body has to be untrained and retrained by a renewed heart, one whose commitments, desires, and beliefs are molded by God through the word and his spirit. And number three, secular researchers have uncovered truths about the human experience that God has already addressed in his word even more clearly, more profoundly, and more expansively. Believers never have to be afraid of science rightly interpreted. True science will never contradict the Bible. Now, a good example of this, if you, you go, I, I imagine most of you have been to the Grand Canyon out here in the West. I just went there a few years ago for the first time, and I thought, I stood on that rim, and I thought, this is a big ditch. This is, this is astonishing. But, but a creationist 
and an evolutionist can stand next to each other and look at the same data, but interpret how it got there differently. And as Bible believers, we can look at the same data, scientific data in the addiction world, and we're going to interpret how it got there differently and what to do about it differently, but we're looking at the same data. But we bring presuppositions from God in his word, whereas they bring presuppositions from their own, uh, their own observations, their own worldview. Now, I, this is what I talked on a little bit before in, in another session, but I want to include it here um, as part of unmasking addiction. And the distinction is between physical dependency and true addiction. And, and if you were in the last session uh, with, with the pastors where I presented freedom at last, just um, you can take a, about a five minute nap and it'll be fine. Um, we're going to look at opioid addiction here. Grandma goes into the hospital for hip surgery, and she's there for three weeks, and she's on an IV with, uh, with uh, feeding her uh, morphine, which is pharmaceutical-grade heroin. And she's on it every day for three weeks. She is, has become physically dependent. Her body has begun to tolerate the drug, when she tries to get off it, it's going to have some withdrawal difficulties, and, and there are other medications that can help her off that. Um, but, but, it, but she's experiencing side effects in that dependency. At mood altering, she, she doesn't like the fact that her moods go up and down or they're flat. Um, she doesn't like the, the, the brain fog, the mind-numbing experiences that she has. And grandma can't wait to get off the drug. Just like those Vietnam vets, when they came back, they couldn't wait to get off it because it interfered with all the things they wanted to get back to. Now, if grandma doesn't have a good home life to go back to, and she's, she's got a lot of miserable things going on in her life, and, and perhaps a lot of poverty or and, you know, a horrible relationships with, with her family, um, the, the mind numbing aspect of the drug and the mood altering is welcome. And now she begins to use the side effects of the drugs to solve the problems of life when she gets back into, uh, in, into her life outside of the hospital. So she, she has a physical dependence, which the world would call, call a physical addiction. And that would, uh, is what happens with opioids and alcohol, for example. But then there is what the world calls true addiction or psychological addiction. That's where you're taking the drug for a psychological reason, we would, we would say for a heart issue. Um, and so now it's, th these are, she, she now develops, if she goes to this uh, drug all the time to solve problems, she develops a sinful habit of the heart to deal with all of these soul problems. Um, and that's where the church comes in because we have the scriptures when people come to Christ, they have the Holy Spirit living in them. They, they, we can disciple them. We can counsel them through the trials of life. We, we want them to have a, a vibrant walk with Jesus Christ, and we want them to have a robust wisdom from Jesus Christ, from his word, so they know how to handle problems. Because the, the word is going to tell us how to handle interpersonal conflict. It's going to tell us how to handle all of the sinful temptations of our hearts, the ambition, the greed, the loss. The Bible has answers to all of those issues. Uh, the NIDA says physical dependence in and of itself does not constitute addiction, but often accompanies addiction. And what, what happens oftentimes, uh, for example, on the street, when somebody starts using an opioid or, or a, uh, a, a synthetic version, um, is uh, going to develop a physical dependency very quickly and, and enjoys the, the, the side effects, the mood altering and brain numbing effects of it and stays on the drug as a way of life because he doesn't have a better way to live life apart from the moods and so forth that the drug can give him. So we overcome chemical dependency with physical de detoxification, but we overcome true addiction or what we call life dominating sins, enslaving sins, uh, that requires heart transformation, and that's progressive sanctification. So why did Sam relapse? He's coming to freedom at last. He's been clean and sober for weeks, and he's been, he's been uh, growing in the Lord and has some joy, and he's, he, he really is doing much better. He hasn't used drugs or alcohol for months. By the way, 
if he was chemically addicted, he couldn't go, if he's, if he's now detoxed and he's been detoxed for weeks or for months, it's not the drug that's pulling him back into it. He doesn't have any drug in him. Sam hasn't used drugs or alcohol for months, but this weekend he relapsed when he got some bad news he wasn't expecting. The uh, world calls that relapse, and we call it going back to your sin. Um, so why that relapse? Does it mean he's once an addict, always an addict, or that an addict is always in recovery? Um, what it, Sam needs salvation, and in Sam's case, he does know the Lord, and he's starting in, in progressive sanctification. But, but what does he need? He needs a growing, character-changing, and satisfying walk with God. And secondly, he needs a growing and stabilizing wisdom from God in order to handle trials and temptations biblically. So I define addictions as the compulsive sinful habits we develop when we repeatedly choose to deal with our trials and temptations in our own ways rather than turning to God and his word for solutions. So sobriety is not the end game. Uh, as I said earlier, um, we, we can be sober and miserable. We can be sober and a thief. We can be sober and an adulterer, but we can't be like Jesus and be any of those things. And what we need, uh, as your notes or as the screen says there, um, we can become sober without Jesus, but we cannot become everything God created us to be without a growing and satisfying relationship with Jesus Christ. Secondly, a growing knowledge of an obedience to God's word. And thirdly, a growing relationship with and accountability to a local church. You have to have all three of those. You leave out any one of those in your toast. And that goes for all of us. Um, if you notice in point B, um, after I give that definition, uh, there's a, a, a saying I've been using in Freedom at Last as I talk to them about wisdom just two paths before our eyes, the way of the fool and the way of the wise. And, and God lays that out in Proverbs. Proverbs is a, is a big part of the Freedom at Last journaling experience. Um, addictions um, often develop this way. Number one, this is on page three at the bottom. We experience something that distresses us, tempting us to find relief, or the lust of the flesh of our sinful nature tempts us to pleasurable experiences that enslave us. And number two, we choose a substance or experience to alter our moods or number, numb our minds. And three, as we repeat the choice, our brain reinforces it. If the choice produces an emotional experience or reward, the brain super habituates the desire until it becomes a, uh, a compulsion. So drop down to Christ likeness is the end game in your notes. Um, Christ-likeness, we often use that as a synonym for Christian maturity or, or godliness. Um, but but I, I remind our folks on uh, pretty much every evening, uh, mature believers are tempted to sin. And mature believers do sin, but mature believers are not dominated by sin. They're not enslaved to sin. They know how to handle trials and temptations by growing through them. Progressive sanctification is growing. Right. And, and I remind them also that Christ likeness is measured in virtue. Sometimes we, if you ask a lot of folks in church, what is Christ likeness? It's, well, it's kind of like being really, really nice like Jesus. You know, it's kind of like a Hallmark soft touch card, you know, that um, when, when Christ likeness is talked about in the Bible, it's, it's, it's expressed in the fruit of the spirit and the virtues of Second Peter 1. It's the development of the character of Jesus, and that affects the way you interact with other people. It's measured in virtues. So freedom at last concentrates on developing a walk with Jesus Christ that produces a fruit of Christian virtues. And I mentioned this in the earlier uh, thing, but I'll, I'll close with this. Uh, soul problems like guilt and shame, bitterness and despair, loneliness, anxiety, anger, greed, sinful ambition, self-centeredness, covetousness, all of those are soul problems. And none of them can be solved by doing something to or with our bodies. Only Jesus Christ can solve soul problems. So we, we talk a lot about Jesus. We, we open our Bibles and we see what Jesus is like. We listen to his words. I remind them when, when, we, when we pray, I say the most important person in this room is Jesus Christ. 
So we're going to start tonight by talking to the most important person in the room. And, and that's important because it's not me and it's not them. But if you've been in a life, self-centered, life-dominating sins, and all of us have this tendency anyway, we think we're the most important person in the room. Everybody ought to be treating us this way and giving us what we want. We're not the most important people in the room. The most important person in the room is Jesus Christ. And he created us for his glory, and we've been vandalized by the fall, and the sanctification process is restoring that image of Jesus in us so that we bring God the glory as our creator and as our redeemer that he deserves. So we, our motto is, Jesus Christ is the only source of freedom that lasts. Let's pray. Lord Jesus, thank you that you have done so much for us. On your work on the cross, on living a sinful, a sin, a sinless, perfect life here on this planet. Thank you that you so loved the world that you came as the only begotten Son of the Father, that whosoever believes in you would not perish in hell but have everlasting life. Thank you for the freedom from the bondage of our sin nature for the power of the Spirit you, grow, you give us as we grow in you and as we obey you. Lord, help us to be better ministers of this word to the people around us, particularly those that are enslaved with life-dominating sins, as we're talking about this weekend. Help us, I pray, in your name. Amen. Uh, Jim, thank you so much. That was awesome. Would you thank Jim with me for what he's done so far? We are so blessed to have you here with us, and I thank you so much. Just the, uh, the way that you put things and explain so well. So thank you. Heard some former students expressing their love for you and how much you've meant to their life. And I can see why, that's just, it's just awesome. Well, before Kevin comes, and this is the last session of today, I want to uh, just remind you that tomorrow we start at, at 8.50 with the song and then the session starts at nine o'clock and Jim is gonna be teaching on helping others to grow out of addiction. Uh, and I, I, love, I love what he's sharing about the church ministering to people who are going through these things. The church should be doing that and can be doing that. And that's such an encouragement to hear that from him. And then the sixth session, seven practical guidelines to use when counseling addicts. We're trying to show the church here that you can have a part in this, that you can minister to these people and come alongside the pastors in the church and help really touch lives and to help build them. So we're so thankful for that. And Kevin will be teaching that. And then we'll look at the multiplicity of addictions, how there are problems all around that people want to excuse as addictions, as diseases, as Jim has dealt with that so wonderfully tonight. And then Pastor Will is going to be teaching on addiction to alcohol at the 1215 session. And then we'll be out after that. And You'll have the rest of the afternoon uh, to yourself. But I just, I'm just so blessed to have these men come and to share with us and the gals what, what they have shared. Thank you so much. And Pastor, thank you for being so supportive of this. We appreciate it so much. Sunday, we have a combined adult Bible fellowship at nine o'clock where there will be a panel discussion based on your questions. And what we're asking you to do is if you would take a card from the table out there in the foyer and uh, write some questions that you would like to have answered and uh, during that that session at nine o'clock we'll try to go over some of those and uh, pastor do you have any advice on what we want them to write out for us or... okay just anything at all that relates to what we've been talking about at the uh, 10 o'clock hour 10 30 hour session 10 Learning to counsel with confidence. Kevin's going to be teaching on that. I just think what a what a timely message that is because uh, all of us have times where we we feel like we should counsel or we should witness to someone, 
but may not have the confidence to do so. We may be afraid that we will stumble or not say something just quite right. And uh, this will be such an encouragement, Kevin, to have you share with us about that. In the evening at six o'clock, Jim Berg completes our conference with helping others face trials through the book of James, James chapter one. What a powerful passage that is on helping people grow in their walk and experiencing the trials as an impact on their growth. So don't miss out on any of this. It's, it's such a blessing. And to have this come right to our own door is a tremendous blessing. And I'm so thankful for that. So I would like to also welcome a dear friend of mine. And that's Kevin Hurd. Would you welcome him as he comes right now to share with us counseling those who struggle with sexual addictions? Oh, very significant and important announcement. Uh, pastries and what? We have coffee and eggs and bacon and collard greens. 8.30 in the morning. Okay, coffee and pastries. Okay. Right now? You good? Okay, let's pray, let's pray once more. Lord, you know that our bodies and our minds, our hearts are coming to a conclusion of a day, a long day for many of us. Uh, and uh, Lord, we ask you to grant us the ability to keep our heart and our mind focused on this subject. Uh, help us to learn what it means to love those who are enslaved and trapped in various types of sin and struggles in their own life. And um, help them to love them like you would, even if it means that those who observe us loving them might think we are accepting and condoning and uh, permitting those things. Help us to love like Jesus did and be willing to be called um, names even as he was when we associate with people who struggle with life struggles and issues. And we pray tonight that you will bless this time and help us to use it in a way that does profit us all and in the end ultimately points us to you, our great and glorious God. We pray in Christ's name. Amen. So let me uh, tell you as we get started about this topic that um, uh, I want to be really clear. I want to be compassionate. I want to be kind. I want to let my pastoral and theological heart govern me as we talk about uh, this topic this evening when it comes to homosexuality and those who uh, would identify themselves as uh, a gay Christian, a gay believer a believer co-equal with you in the body of Christ, someone who is just as saved and just as justified as you and who uh, proclaims that they hold to the inerrant, sufficient, authoritative word of Scripture just like you do. And if that's never been your uh, experience to encounter someone like that, then um, you must be checking out of the world because it's everywhere. As we think about this whole issue of homosexuality and gay Christians and stuff like that. We live in a culture that really obviously has so imbibed that. I mean, you just cannot escape it. I mean, you must be living somewhere in a, another world because everything you look at, whether it's on television, whether it's the shows that come on, whether you watch them or you don't watch them, you just get a glimpse of them as they pass through. They are there. A commercial is interesting. I don't care if you're looking at yogurt commercials you will see couples enjoying gay couples enjoying yogurt you will see uh different types of shows that are mentioned that literally when they are there with no absolute connection to the product but it's there right i mean um i remember just watching some of those commercials like a uh, a coca-cola commercial i go what does it have to do with coke you know, what does it have to do with Cabana yogurt? What does it have to do with uh, Dish or Direct TV? It has really nothing to do with the product that the commercial is offering, but woven into that in the culture we live in, it is something that really has become normative in our culture for sure. It's there. And not only that, you know, there are books that are out there and things that just really now seem to make that a part of the real world in which we live in. 
And I, and I want you to know straight up, God loves those people, right? He loves them, and, and I want to love them, and I hope you love them, and you love them enough to speak truth, and you know what kind of truth to speak to them when it comes to that. I live up in the northeast corner of the state of Georgia where the Appalachian Mountains run. It's a very mountain culture, and, um, and I'll never forget, I was at a McDonald's one morning having a cup of coffee with a homosexual guy. And when I finished, the elders of the gate of McDonald's, those guys who sat around and solve all the world's problems, you know, at McDonald's there, called me over and said, hey, preacher, come here, come here, come here. They said, don't you know that that guy over there you're talking to is a homosexual? I go, well, absolutely I do. They said, well, you better not be hanging around people like that. People will think you're like that. And I was like, wow, that's, that is it. It's there in the culture and it's obviously something that we all are seeing, but there is a sense in which I want to keep my distance from those people. Uh, they're not like us, they say. They're not from, they're, they're different. I don't want to be around them. But I said to those men who were sitting there, I said, if I don't spend some time with him and, and, and shoot straight with him what I believe and think from scripture about this and share the gospel with him, who's going to do that? Who will do that? Yeah, so th this is a real war thing, uh, issue that we deal with, and, and it's there. But here's something that has turned over the last few years, and that is that now we begin to see that there is something that maybe has entered our church culture world in a way that uh, maybe we never thought of before. This book by uh, Matthew Vines called God and the Gay Christian. Anybody familiar with that book, seen that book, aware of that book? I'm not recommending that you read it other than the fact that it's a book that will give you great insight into how now those who have chosen a lifestyle of homosexuality are not thinking of themselves as, well, that's y'all and that's us. They see them as, this is us. This is who we are. We are just as much in the family of God and a part of the family just as you are. I'll give you a couple of quotes to show you what I mean here. Matthew Vine says in his book, um, The Gay Christian, Christians who affirm the full authority of Scripture can also affirm committed, monogamous, same-sex relationships. He writes in his argument, the fiercest objection to LBGTQ uh, equality, those based on religious beliefs, can begin to fall away. The tremendous pain endured by LGBT youth in many Christian homes can become a relic of the past. Christianity's reputation in much of the Western world can begin to rebound. Together, we can reclaim our light. He says, that, and these are the two issues that he says here. I'll give them to you. One, the gay Christian will say that the Bible does not address same-sex attractions but rather unnatural and excessive lust and harmful sexual relationships. So here's the pitch. The Bible does talk about homosexuality, but it's not talking about loving, monogamous relationships that people have chosen to be in. These are the harmful sexual relationships that they are talking about. Secondly, the issue that Matthew Vines is trying to convince people of is that the gay Christian will say that same-sex attraction and homosexuality is about sexual orientation. And you need to underscore that word because that is the key phrase that you're going to have to learn how to have a conversation biblically about, right? You can say all day long to those people, the Bible says that homosexuality is a sin, uh, that, it, that it is an abomination. And they'll say, you're absolutely right. All those hateful, harmful unloving, uh, gang rape type things in the Bible. God hates all that stuff, but he's okay with the same-sex, monogamous, loving, committed relationships of homosexuality. And so the gay Christian is going to say, and I'm using that in quotations, by the way, will say that since the same-sex attraction and homosexuality is about sexual orientation, it is an inherent part of the person, and therefore it is unchangeable. Matthew Vine goes on to say, gay people cannot choose 
to follow opposite sex attractions because they have no opposite sex attractions to follow, nor can they manufacture them. They're saying, that's just not the way we are wired. You might be wired that way, but we're not. They go, he goes on to say, it isn't gay Christians who are sinning against God by entering into monogamous loving relationships. It is the church that is sinning against them by rejecting their intimate relationships. So now you are the problem. You are an unloving Christian because you don't accept this person who says that that is the way they are designed, that is their orientation. And God says nothing to condemn or anything about those kind of loving monogamous relationships. You are the one who has misunderstood it. I'll, I'll just give you a couple of thoughts he goes on to say. Vine's twofold assumption about homosexual orientation leads to a powerful emotional appeal. And if you watch every commercial, you watch every report, everything that you see from a secular viewpoint, they are going to build on that orientation that I, they cannot help. They are just made this way. And the sorrow and the sadness and the hurt and the struggles they have gone through because people just don't understand that that's who they are in their orientation as if they could help it. You're treating them in such a bad way, they're going to say, because you don't really understand that we're not choosing to be this. We are just this. This is our orientation. And when Christians ignorantly summon gay people to change, they say, you are creating more heartbreak and even death in their life because they cannot live with the reality and no one accepts them that this is just the orientation that they have. Vine's books makes it seem that the only way to show care for people struggling with homosexuality is to accept them in their lifestyle. That's the only way you can really relate to them, according to Vine's. And that challenge will become very, very real to you when you meet a man like I'm about to show you a video of, whose name is Kevin. Listen to what he says, and this is the now normative of those coming into the church and trying to say, we're just as committed as you are. We love the Bible just as you do. We believe in expository preaching just like you do. You're the ones who have misunderstood the scriptures and you've misunderstood the issue of orientation. Listen to what he says. Oh, hello everyone. My name is Kevin and I've been wanting to start a YouTube channel for like a billion years. And I've had a couple really failed attempts at doing it. But you know what I'm gonna, I had said today, I woke up and I said, you know what, screw it. I'm gonna put in my contacts, I'm gonna do my hair, I'm gonna put on a clean shirt, and I'm gonna make a video because that's what I've wanted to do for a long time. Um, so here you go. You don't get fancy lighting, you don't get a fancy background, you don't get a fancy camera, you just get me. This is me being super authentic with you. If you're just now joining with me in my journey and in my story, things you should know. Uh, I am a gay Christian, and that's pretty exciting for me to say out loud. I wrote on my blog this past week that it's a little bit weird to kind of say still because it's not something I've said until very recently. I kind of came to terms with my sexuality and my faith about three and a half months ago in June at uh, an, a conference put on by the Reformation Project. You can check them out in the link below. Um, but yeah, I'm a gay Christian and that's pretty cool for me. A couple of things I've noticed since coming out. One, I have not been depressed a single day since. And I think that's something crazy because like my entire life, I just, oh yeah, I suffered from depression. And my therapist was like, yeah, you're suffering from depression. And I didn't realize how strongly tied it was to me suppressing my sexuality and the expression of who God created me to be. I mean, a lot of times like you'll, you'll meet LGBT people, especially LGBT people of faith who do not feel comfortable with expressing that because either their circumstance or their faith background or whatever. Um, and you'll find like a lot of us are kind of on happy pills because we can't handle life because it's hard. And I'm not saying that depression isn't real. I'm not saying that people who are taking uh, antidepressants are, you know, that that's not valid. Um, Cause sometimes you need a little bit of help in that regard. But what I'm saying for me is that I can now point to me suppressing my sexuality as the key component in me being depressed over the past 11 years. Like 11 years and to be set free from that, it's something beautiful. I think the coolest thing that has happened since me coming out is I've gotten a ton of 
emails and tweets and Facebook messages from people saying, thank you for sharing your story because it's giving me hope. And I think that that is amazing to me because I honestly, my story is nothing remarkable. I'm just willing to talk about it. You know, there are millions of people out there who have a story just like mine. And we've been robbed of our courage and our bravery because we've been told that the way you're made is wrong. We've been told that how you were created to be does not line up with normalcy, with what we're going to accept. And so because we so desperately want to be a part of our faith tradition, because we so desperately want to be accepted, we shut up and we suppress and we suppress and it just, it ends up doing a lot more harm than it does good. And it's been really, really special for me to read the words of my readers and followers saying, hey, like, thank you for writing what you're writing. So I want to tell you now, um, I'm not going to stop writing about, you know, the intersections of faith and sexuality. I'm not going to stop spreading the love of God. Yesterday I got, uh, I attracted some unwanted attention actually from someone who called me a false teacher. And you know what? It honestly excited me because when you start speaking the truth that God has given to you, when you start living authentically as you were created to be, you know, you're going to start rocking some boats. You're going to start, you know, messing with people's paradigms of what it means to be Christian because I am more in love with Jesus today than I've ever been in my entire life. And I'm more committed to my faith than I've ever been. I want to say this. If you are an LGBT person and you're in the closet and you're in your church or you're an LGBT person or ally or someone who has been a part of a faith community and you thought differently about something and you're ostracized or kicked out, I want to let you know, God never kicked you out of the family. He loves you. He wants to be close to you. And he's pursuing you so hard to let you know that he loves you. And so today, uh, no matter where you're sitting, standing, crying, whether you're in a room full of people or you're alone on a bus, uh, know that God loves you a whole lot. Um, that's it for this first video. It's kind of just like an introduction slash thank you for all the love and support you've sent me to my blog. Um, and if you didn't know about my blog, go down to the link below. It's thekevingarcia.com. Check it out. Subscribe. Um, fun things for me. I'm working on a new ebook right now talking about my journey. And yeah, that's about it. So if you like this video, like it, share it, comment it, um, subscribe, and I'll just keep putting these up hopefully once a week. And until I have a budget, they're going to be on my iPhone. Um, and that's cool too. I think you're great. Um, love you. Bye. So I have a question for you. If Kevin Garcia sits down at a table with you, and starts telling you about the love of God, about the scriptures, how that once he understood what God's word really said, that he was free from 11 years depression and he was truly finally free, had freedom that last. How are you going to talk to him? What are you going to say? Again, it's no longer the conversation, well, this is us and you Christians are crazy over here. No, we're one of you. We're, we're in the family. We're in the kingdom. We are loved and justified and accepted by God and believe the scripture is sufficient and authoritative and we let it run our lives. What are you going to do? How do you have that conversation? How are you going to have that? What conversation are you going to have with the person who is bought into the emotional tug of how hard life has been for that individual who hasn't been accepted and understood that that's the way God made them and that is their orientation and they have no choice really that's just who they are. How do you have that conversation with them? How do you do that? Well, here's what I'd like to do. In our time that we have, I want to just do two things. I want to talk about how the Bible is used in that conversation by them and really what you need to be aware of when the scriptures are used to have a conversation with. I mean, think about this. It's one thing to have a conversation with someone who says, I don't care about the Bible. I don't even want to talk about the Bible. And another thing to have a conversation with someone who says, yeah, let me get my Bible. I, I, I got the same Bible you do, and I believe in the Bible just like you do. What do you do? Well, here they are. So there are 
six passages basically that the quote gay Christian, those who have uh, begun to say they are believers and accepted just as we are, are going to turn to, and you can see them listed on your passage there. And so what they're going to say is passages like Genesis 19, uh, was God judging gang rape? That is wrong. God hates that. That's unloving. That's unkind. And those other passages condemn Sodom for cruel treatment of outsiders and believe it of all and believe this or not. And they will say it is really a passage teaching the lack of care for the needy and the poor. That's how they have interpreted those texts. When you come to the New Testament passages there, they'll say Paul's description of same-sex behavior in this passage is indisputably negative. But he also explicitly describes the behavior he condemned as lustful. He made no mention of love, fidelity, monogamy, or commitment. So how should we understand Paul's words? Do they apply to all same-sex relationships or to only to lustful fleeting ones. Let me just tell you what's happening here. It is the same old approach that the serpent used in the garden when he said, has God really said? Is that what he really meant in those verses? Are you sure? When he said that, did he not mean this? And so Matthew Vines and that whole community has taken the Bible and said, the problem is you just misunderstood the text for centuries. You've got it all wrong. You misunderstood it. He's trying to re, re, relativize the Bible to make it something that now has become relative in a way that makes us think of what's going on in the culture as the interpretation of what the Bible was really saying all alone. Matthew Vines says, and I'm, I'm about done with that, okay? He said, the bottom line is this. The Bible does not directly address the issue of same-sex orientation or the expression of that orientation. While its six references to same-sex behavior are negative, the concept of same-sex behavior in the Bible is, in, is sexual excess, not sexual orientation. So those six passages that they are utilizing and pulling and are going to want to have a conversation with you about are a reminder of a couple very, very important things. First of all, it reminds us that if you're going to have a conversation with anyone, and particularly in this context, you better make sure that you are a theologian to some degree. And I don't mean you have to go to a school and get a degree in theology, but I mean you have to understand the God of the Bible and the Bible that that God has given us. If you don't understand it, you are going to never have any conversation gets anywhere with him. You have to be a theologian. I mean, everybody has a view about God, right? And everybody in one sense is a theologian in one sense in that they think certain thoughts about God, how they view God, what they think about God, what they think about life. The issue is, are they are good or bad theologians, right? Are they really theologians who are letting the Bible help them think rightly about God, or they're reading something into the Bible trying to tell themselves that's what God is and what he's like. And so it's a reminder that if you're going to engage in this discussion with them, you must know the scriptures. And if we know the scriptures and we understand that this issue is a life choice and a a lifestyle that has been chosen, we'll talk about the word orientation in a moment. But if we, in the end, agree that the Bible teaches that this is not right, this is a sin, then we also have to believe that like all sin, if that really is what it is, and we believe that's what it is, then all sin and all behavior can be changed, right? But if you get trapped in the word orientation, which I'm going to talk about in a little bit, you'll never really have a way to talk about things being changed in their life. So a few things to keep in mind. If you're going to have a conversation with anyone about the Bible, this is true anywhere, in any context, anything you're talking about, you can never sever a verse from its context, right? You can't pull these six passages out of a context of the scripture and say, this is what they mean. You don't know what they mean unless you know what's around them, right? You have to understand the context, and you're, you're clear with that. I mean, you have to understand biblical narrative the whole story of scripture or those individual verses can be made to say any and everything they just want to make them say. 
Another thing we have to be reminded of and remember and keep in mind is that with same-sex marriage or attractions or homosexuality, you can't understand what the Bible says about that apart from the creation story. And that's, again, part of understanding the bigger picture of Scripture, not a verse here and trying to argue with them about those verses individually, but in the context of the greater narrative of Scripture, knowing the creation story, knowing how and why God made a man and a woman, male and female, and his design for procreation, all of those big pieces are a part of having a good conversation if we're going to talk with someone about the Scripture. And you can't understand any of those passages that may be remotely pulled out unless you really have an accurate view of God's holiness and just wrath that's taught in the rest of the Bible. So if you don't know the narrative of Scripture, you don't understand the creation story, you don't understand why God made a man and a woman and what procreation is all about and what justice and righteousness and all those things are about, you're just going to be lost in the weeds trying to help them think through just one little verse here and there. It's all a part of the big story you have to have in that conversation with them. So when you take Scripture and you do that and you have this conversation with them, knowing that we've got to keep all of Scripture every bit of scripture in view here, interpreting passages with passages, letting the Bible do its own interpretation. There are three things that I think I'd encourage you to keep in mind in that conversation. And here they are, first of all. One, be clear about the terms that you are using. And what I mean by that is orientation versus desires, okay? So the argument is that they will say, the Bible doesn't say anything about orientations the orientation of a person it's that, in fact they'll say there's just no category in the bible what's in the bible is all this unloving uncommitted harmful sexual sinful relationships but there's nothing about orientation and longings and love for someone else of the same sex that is just not in there and when it comes to the term orientation, what's really interesting is that psychologists actually know a great deal less about homosexual orientation than they claim, because that's what you hear all the time, that studies have shown that this is the orientation, this is the way they, the individual is made, they can't make choices to go against what they are naturally, they don't have any other attractions, that's just who they are, but they are honest, if you read their literature, to show you that they literally don't know a whole lot about orientation. Listen to what they say. This is their own literature. I didn't make this up. When the American Psychological Association, the APA, weighed in on homosexuality in 1952 with the first edition of the Diagnostic and Statistical Manual of Mental Illness, the DSM, it declared homosexuality to be a mental illness. That was 1952. By 1974, they write in their own literature, it declared that homosexuality was no longer a mental illness. By 2000, it declared that the people with mental illness were the ones who were troubled by their homosexuality. In other words, you are the problem now. You have the disorder. You have the mental problem. And this is a very important note here. They write, this dramatic shift did not happen because of any new information about the nature of sexual orientation. That is the buzzword. That's the word that you're going to hear. This is just the way we are. This is our orientation. But that shift to that concept did not happen because of any new information about the nature of sexual orientation. They write, no empirical data contributed to increased understanding about the influence of nature or nurture in determining orientation. The APA changed its position on homosexuality because of the increasing cultural acceptance of homosexuality. The APA knows as much about sexual orientation today as it did in the 1950s. It's gotten no more wiser about it. Currently, the APA defines sexual orientation, and this is helpful to think through how we can biblically have this conversation. They define sexual orientation as an enduring pattern of emotional, romantic and or sexual attractions to men, women, or both sexes. When describing where this attraction comes from, the APA is honest that, quote, although much research has examined the possible genetic, hormonal, developmental, social, and cultural influences on sexual orientation, no findings have emerged that permit scientists to conclude that sexual orientation is determined by any particular factor or factors. In other words, they know nothing really 
substantially about orientation. And yet that is the buzzword. That's what is really presented in every commercial and every tear jerking story that you hear and why life is so hard because that is just the orientation. And, and but it, there's nothing to prove and substantiate that they really know anything about that as the cause for that. So here's our struggle. We don't find the word orientation in the Bible. So sometimes people conclude, well, the Bible just doesn't have anything to say about same-sex attractions or orientations. And the problem is we have to do what we often do with real life issues today is learn to look for the, the examples, the descriptions, the, 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 the patterns of people in scripture and find what scripture calls them to define and describe what they are calling them, right? I mean, we don't read anything in the Bible with the word about PTSD, right? We don't, we don't find that in the Bible. We don't find in the Bible anything about reactive attachment disorder. We don't find the phrase defi uh, oppositional defiance disorder. We just don't find those terms in the Bible. And the problem for us as Christians say, well, I guess since those terms are not in the Bible, it must not be something the Bible addresses. But what we have to do is reinterpret those terms in biblical language. So what is it when we think about orientation that that word is not in the Bible per se, what is it that best describes orientations and as the uh, American Psychological Association describes as those longings and those, those desires? What is it that the Bible uses to describe that? Well, what it uses to describe is the word desire. The Bible recognizes that we as human beings all have desires. In fact, it's one of the common elements running through the scripture describing humanity. We all have desires. And for example, just a few in 2 Peter 3, verse 3 and Jude 16, it talks about those who follow their sinful desires. You can, so that word desire becomes a word that says, oh, that's what they are talking about when they describe that they're, they're, there is this longing and this attraction and this want for something, which they say is normal and natural. The Bible begins to say, well, we know what that is. It's called a desire. And sometimes that desire can be a sinful desire. Romans 13, 14 and Galatians 5, 16 tell us not to gratify the desires of the flesh. You see, this word desire is the key phrase to be thinking about when you start thinking about orientation versus desires. D don't get trapped into, well, the Bible doesn't say anything about orientations. Well, it does talk about your orientation, your desire, what your propensities are, what you're longing for, what you'd like to have, what you feel you're drawn to. They are called desires. Colossians 3, 5 describes them as evil desires. And James 1, 14 talks about all of us when we are tempted are lured and enticed by our what? Own desires. So when we have this conversation, listen, we just can't get pigeonholed into six verses. We got to get this whole narrative in our mind, how God created the world and everything in it. Why he made a woman and made a man. What's the importance of male and female there? What's the importance of procreation? All of that has to come into that. And when they start saying, but, but, but that may be the way some people are, we're just different. We're made with an orientation that's different. And the Bible is not condemning those orientations that we have that are loving and committed and monogamous and relationships and marriages that are just like yours, that we just are attracted to those, it doesn't deal with them. We can say, yes, it does deal with those. It deals with our desires and our longings that are in our heart. And those are just a few examples. And so that distinction is so very, very, very important. So be sure you know which term to talk about. Because you talk about orientation, they don't even have much information to really prove anything about orientation. But when we come to the Bible, we have plenty to talk about when it comes to what people desire, what they long for. And not every desire can be a good desire. We can't just say because you have an orientation towards something and a desire towards something that that is normative, right? How do you even begin to do life if any and every desire can be looked at as somewhat normative? Desires can't be that. So second thing, be confident. Be confident in something. And that is that a persist, persistent desire and a behavior is not the way to determine right and wrong. 
And that's what they're saying. That's our orientation. So it must be right. Well, orientations, desires cannot be how you determine right and wrong. That's a very subjective and very scary place to go, right? What if I say, I just have a desire to kill some people tonight, right? Is that okay if I'm like a Christian murderer now because I have a longing and a desire to kill someone? I mean, where, where does that stop? When you begin to let desire dictate what's right and what's wrong, what is acceptable and is not acceptable. That's what's happening in that conversation. This is acceptable because this is our orientation and desire. Just take it as far as you want to go and ask yourself what desires are going to be okay. Is it okay if I have a desire to commit adultery against Pam and it's just my orientation and my longing? Does that make it right to be a Christian adulterer? You would say that's crazy. To call myself a Christian adulterer or, or a Christian like uh, murderer, you know, or a Christian thief. I just have a desire to steal, right? You can't let desire determine rights and wrongs. And that's why this conversation about desires is so very, very important. So you want to be clear about your terms. Don't get sucked into a, a word that really they're going to say is not in the Bible because there is a word in the Bible about orientation. It's called desires. And, and, and be very confident that you can't just let stories that are sad, and, and they are sad, and, and they're heartbreaking about how their orientations have created all kinds of struggles and depressions and hardships in their life. Um, and we must accept that as right because it's making life so hard for them. We just cannot let those kind of those behaviors become the way to determine right and wrong. Lastly, you want to be compassionate. And I would circle that word well, because we want to be clear about what it is we're talking about, which are desires that are in the heart of man. We want to be confident that God doesn't determine rights and wrongs by our, our desires. Those things have to be determined by something other than us, and that is God and his word. But do you want to show compassion when addressing the reality and the possibility of someone changing their orientation. And I use the word orientation there, which means biblically desires. Those things that are in us called desires are able to be changed, right? The Bible has com a completely different view of sinful desires. Listen to this. You know this passage. It's right out there in your foyer and part of the theme of this conference. It says, seeing that his divine power has granted to us everything pertaining to life and godliness through the true knowledge of him who called us by his own glory and excellence. For by these, he has granted to us his precious and magnificent promises. Why did he give us this word? Why did he give us these truths? Listen carefully. So that by them, you may become partakers of the divine nature, having escaped the corruption that is in the world by lust. What Peter is saying is, is that the patterns of sinful desires lead to what? Corruption. Those sinful desires, those things that are in us that lead us in the wrong way always lead to corruption. And he's saying that believers in Jesus Christ can escape that corruption through the power of Jesus Christ, through the promises of the word of God. See, the Bible takes a whole different look at desire orientation than the culture and the world would when it comes to this topic. One of the most precious and most powerful truths the Bible has ever told us is that believers are not locked into who they are by their desires and by their nature. They are not locked into the corruption that was created by their strong, as this passage, passage says, sinful desires. They can escape them. That's what Peter is saying. We can escape that corruption. Another, another way of saying it, we can be free and we can be free at last and have freedom that really lasts. One other passage Paul tells the Corinthians, do you not know that the unrighteous will not inherit the kingdom of God? Do not be deceived, neither fornicators, nor idolaters, nor adulterers, nor effeminate, nor homosexuals, nor thieves, nor the covetous, nor drunkards, nor revilers, nor swindlers will inherit the kingdom of God. Now, let's just pause there. So if we just take that one thing out and we say, well, he's talking about the unloving, unkind, uh, cruel homosexual relationships. Those are the people who are not in the kingdom. Are we going to say that about everything else is that they're unloving, unkind fornicators and they're unloving and unkind drunks and they're unloving and unkind adulterers? But if you're not that, those things are okay. 
You see, Paul is saying to the Corinthians, that is not what we are like. That's not what defines us and describes us. Because he says in verse 11, and such were some of you, but you were washed, but you were sanctified, but you were justified in the name of the Lord Jesus Christ and the spirit of our God. You see, when the Christian homosexual says the Bible doesn't address gay Christians, listen carefully, there's, and he says there's no example of gay Christians. It's only about the hateful, harmful, horrible relationships that people fall into. That's what God's condemning. There's just no example of gay Christians in the Bible. There's a reason for that because they're not in the Bible. I mean, We've all committed some of these sins, right? But no sweeter word could be said than we're such were some of you. It changes us. It's who we are, are now is not identified by our previous desires and longings, but who we have become when we have become a believer. We were such, but we are no longer. We are not identified by our past sin, right? We can't say, well, I am just a Christian drunk. I am a Christian um, adulterer. I'm not a Christian, any of those things. I was those things. But because it is about desires and longings and the gospel changing us from the inside out, we are no longer defined and described by that. God takes all of us, adulterers, murderers, drunks, swindlers, and homosexuals, and he changes who we are. He gives us a new identity. Listen, we are not identified by our sin. We are identified now by the son, God's son. So maybe the concluding statement I want to put on the board for you might be the real reason this is such a huge struggle for us when it comes to this topic. People assume a person can be a gay Christian because they are more familiar with what the world has to say about homosexuality and same-sex attraction than they are with God's powerful, transforming grace. That's probably an indicting statement to us if we think about it. If you begin to have conversations with fellow believers, often the conversation will go along that line. And particularly when someone in their family has said, you know, I'm, I'm a homosexual, I'm, I'm, I'm a Christian. They somehow see that as, that, that, that's, that's right. I, I get that. That makes sense. I understand that. I always thought you had that propensity and tendency there and now I just realize that's the way you have been made by God and and there's such an acceptance and we are not as familiar with the transforming power of the gospel we don't really often realize what it is we have in this book and what this book the bible promises to do by grace through Christ right to change lives reminds me and I'll close with this story there was a story told of um a young production manager who one day was sitting at his desk. And as he was sitting at his desk, ready to end the day, it had been a frustrating week. He had found no new acts or shows to begin to put on the market there in New York. And as he closed up his desk and got ready to leave, this guy walks in with a paper bag in his hand. And as he comes in, he says, hey, I've got this show and I got to show this to you. And it is going to like make you a lot of money. And the guy said, listen, man, I, I, I'm, I'm done. I've had a hard day. I don't want to talk about this anymore. Uh, just come back tomorrow. He said, no, 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 no. He said, let me show you. You got to see this. And so he reaches into the bag and he says, well, show me what you got. He reaches in and he grabs out and he sets a little uh, piano on the desk. He reaches in and he grabs this frog and he sets the frog on the piano bench and says, that's Fred. And Fred can play the piano. And Fred begins to play classical music and piano like you have never, ever heard in your life. And this guy is going, this is amazing. This is the best act I've ever seen. We're going to make a lot of money on this. Let me reach in the drawer and grab the contract and we'll get going here. The guy says, no, 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 there's more. There's more in the bag. And so he reaches in the bag and he pulls out a goldfish bowl. And in this goldfish, in this bowl is this goldfish swimming around. He reaches in and he grabs it and he shakes her off and he sets her on the piano leaning up against and he said that's Ethel and Ethel can sing so Fred is playing away and Ethel is just singing her little fish heart out 
And he goes, this is amazing. We're going to kill the market with this show. Nobody has ever had anything like this. And he gets the contract out and he said, let me fill this out and, and we'll, we'll get going and I'll find out where to send you all your money from this show. And he goes, whoa, 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 no, wait. He said, I can't do it. The guy said, I just cannot do it. It's not what you think it is. So he grabbed Ethel off the piano, put her in the bowl, put the bowl back into the bag, grabbed the piano, grabbed Fred, threw him back in the bag and said, I, I just can't do it. It's, 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 just, it's not what you think. He says, what do you mean? He said, it's all a trick. It's really not what you think it is. He says, well, if you can't do it, if you're unwilling to go into contract to put the show on the road, at least tell me how you did this. He said, well, you see, Ethel can't really sing. Fred is a ventriloquist. And he walks out of the office with his bag. And the point is, he really has no idea what he had in the bag. And brothers, I think when it comes to this topic, we just don't really realize what we have in the book that we really can talk about desires, orientations. We can talk about how God doesn't tell us that our desires are something that we can just let determine normative and what's right. And those desires that don't line up with what God says he wants us to be are able to be changed, changed into the very image and the likeness of Christ. So my challenge to us is not to become more and more familiar with the language of the culture and more and more familiar with the sad stories as they are, and they're heartbreaking. Well, let's become more familiar with God's powerful, transforming grace that's found in his word. If we do that, we'll see people's lives changed, even those who now say there's no need to change because it's okay who we are. We'll see them come to change. Let's pray together. Father, we thank you as we deal with a subject that is obviously in every part of the world in which we live in, shows we watch on television, the commercials we see, the people, the friends we talk with, Lord, they um, somewhat are more familiar with the way the world thinks about this topic than they are what your word says. So would you help us as we think through what it means to really have these conversations to be very clear and understand what it means to have desires and that desires are often going in the wrong direction. They're not what determine normative. We can't know right and wrong just based on what we desire and what we long for. Some of those desires, as your word said, lead us to corruption. We pray that most of all, we'd be compassionate with those or to really, when we have those conversations, to know that change is not easy in this area. Changing those patterns of sinful desires are not just read a verse and pray and it's better. There's a lot of work to escape that kind of corruption. Help us to be compassionate with them, to know that it's hard, to know that there's no quick, easy fix in a prayer that just solves it all, that there is struggles. And there are temptations that just keep coming and will continue to come. But let us be compassionate in the way that we let them know, but God is not against them, but God is for them. And God will change them through Christ and through this glorious gospel of grace. And let them become sons and daughters, true sons and daughters of your kingdom, who really display and manifest to an onlooking world how that you change lives and you change lives that point to your son. We pray this in Christ's name. Amen. Thank you, Kevin. I think it'll stick with us, truly, the difference between our desires and God's truth and how we determine it. Thank you so much. Tomorrow, we start at 8.30 with the mandatory donuts and coffee. Uh, I don't know that there'll be any you know, Southern Greens and that and all, but you can come for that. We start the session at nine o'clock, helping others to grow out of addiction, and then seven practical guidelines to use when counseling addicts. And then we'll have a, a break. By the way, the refreshments and all are in the gymnasium. I encourage you to go down there, down this direction to the end. And then uh, we'll go into multiplicity of addictions and we'll finish up with addiction to alcohol with 
our pastor. We're so thankful for what God has done in his life and how he's touched so many, he and Lisa. Sunday, we have a, a special combined adult Bible fellowship at 9 a.m. And uh, please, if you have any questions from what you have heard over the last day or so, please, a day or so, no, the last day, if you would go ahead and write those questions down and if you'll turn those in so that we can look at them and, and pick several and that we'll have uh, the ability to have a panel discussion on this. And then at uh, Sunday morning service, learning to counsel with confidence, Dr. Kevin Hurd again, Sunday night, helping others face trials through the lens of James 1. I hope that you will come and be with us and thank you again for coming today. What a blessing to have you here. You've been encouragement to us very, very much. And I trust that these sessions have been a blessing to you. And I know that tomorrow and Sunday they will be as well. Please stand with me, please. And we'll close with a word of prayer and we'll be dismissed. Lord, I thank you that you have given these men a great insight into your word and how to apply it to the personal problems of living. I pray, Father, you would give us a heart of compassion for those who are struggling with these issues. And Lord, may this church be a center for the healing of souls. And we'll thank you, Father. Bless us now as we go to our homes, protect each one, bring us back safely again tomorrow. May we honor you in all we say and do and think. In Jesus' name, amen. God bless you all. Thanks for coming.